actually, the, the, the Communication Act of 1934 did in, include some restrictions um, on the ability of these giant corporations to grow even bigger. Um, and I, I guess I want to point out that by including still this requirement that broadcasting work in the public interest, convenience, and necessity, um, it left open uh, some space that activists over the years have exploited to press, our, to press the, the FCC to regulate broadcasters in a way that make them more responsive to the public interest um, and to, that have given the public more access uh, to radio. Um, for example, uh, thanks to pressure from activists, uh, uh, the public finally got public standing in license renewal procedures, which means that uh, when, they, when the FCC has a hearing on whether or not to renew a license, any member of the public has a right to write in and object to the renewal of that license, um, uh, either to pose an informal inject objection to the renewal of that license, or to file an official objection to the renewal of the license. And uh, the, I should mention that the Chicago Media Action, what was it, two, three years ago? 2005. 2005. 2005. In 2005, we challenged every broadcast license of every broadcaster in, in the city of Chicago, claiming that they had failed to serve the public interest. And, um, they're all sure still there. They're all still there, unfortunately. The, the case, though, is still pending at the FCC. It's okay, the case, third is still appeal. Pending. case is still pending at the FCC. And I need to point out that we've cost these bastards, you know, thousands of dollars in legal fees. Lots of paper. Um, lots, <laughs> lots of, paper. Lots of paper. So the, the fact that a activists were able to win that right, to win public standing um, in license renewal procedures, um, they, they were able to win limits on the reach of networks, they were able to win a, a ban on cross ownership of um, a, a owner of a radio or television station in, in a town. Still to this day, cannot also own a, a newspaper, the major daily newspaper in that town. The reason we have that arrangement here in Chicago is they they were grandfathered in, um, and uh, and uh, we also had briefly in the 1970s and 80s incentives for minority and and women ownership of broadcast outlets. Um, and we had also something called the Fairness Doctrine, which uh, required broadcasters to address controversial public issues and to air multiple sides of, of, of those, uh, uh, multiple points of view on those issues. All right, um, I think this is a good place to kick it over to Scott, who's going to talk about sort of one of the other major developments um, uh, uh, in uh, kind of the, the fight for a more democratic media system. Yes, um, it was determined that the commercial broadcaster simply could not provide anything resembling an adequate amount of time and space uh, on their uh, channels that they were, uh, our channels that we let them use. Um, and so uh, over through the 50s, uh, and, and more, much more strongly with the creation of the Carnegie Commission in 67, um, it was decided uh, belatedly that the United States needed some kind of uh, national organized public uh, media system. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, it, it, it was only partially formed. Uh, I'll get into some of the details of that. Um, but I, I thought it was very interesting when Steve started. He mentioned uh, he went back to World War I, and I actually have a picture from that era of uh, one of these uh, military broadcasters. It's actually it's sort of a, it looks like a, a World War I, sort of an RV. It's like a, a, a battle wagon with antennas sticking out from all different angles um, with all these um, soldiers and officers lined up standing in front like they're very proud of their vehicle. It's a very interesting picture. Um, uh, but, but that is how, the, that's how radio started. That is correct. It's very interesting. Point. And it's also interesting to realize when you think of how computers got started during World War II, they were originally used for uh, espionage and other military purposes. That's how these technologies have developed. That's where they start. Uh, DARPAnet as well, of course, we all know was the Defense Department owned. So um, that's, that's the roots. Um, and Steve did a, a very good job of setting up this very Important history of, uh, of what the public, the rights the public has seized and, and had to demand 
in order to get any say so in the way that the, the uh, mass communication system in this country has been set up. Um, now, uh, Steve uh, uh, also mentioned um, some of the early struggles. There was a one uh, uh, led by Frida Hennock, uh, the FM struggle, that's very important to mention also because that's where some, some extra uh, channels were set aside on the FM band for uh, educational and community broadcasters. Uh, uh, we, uh, we owe uh, that uh, fight uh, uh, brought about a number of the stations that we have now at our universities and the independent community radio stations, which uh, are some of the only sources of information and diverse viewpoints that we have left um, available to the general public through broadcasting. Um, now, uh, I mentioned the Carnegie Commission in 1967. Originally, that was set up just to create a system of public television. They actually forgot about radio until, I think, the night before uh, uh, something called NPR was just sort of dropped into the legislation at the last minute. Um, and uh, as you probably know, the Ford Foundation was very closely uh, uh, involved in uh, early funding of educational, as it was called then, educational broadcasting in the United States, and, uh, and that was a good thing in that uh, there weren't too many uh, other institutions willing to fund it as we tried to convince government to provide more money for public media. Um, however, um, the Ford Foundation sort of conveniently forgot to push for a really important aspect of this system that was created by the Carnegie Commission, and that was some kind of uh, true accountability. Um, we, we were left with a a rather weakly funded when you compare it to uh, any other country. We have one of the weakest public media systems uh, in terms of government funding um, in the world, a uh, developed uh, Western nation at least. Um, and uh, 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 but they really forgot to quote forgot um, to create a, a system of accountability, um, and that's pretty unusual actually because if you trace the history, as Steve mentioned again. Uh, this very good introduction, he talked about public utilities, and um, I believe what we're coming around to now is the realization that media uh, uh, journalism is all is really is uh, it's a public utility, and we're going to have to start looking at it and thinking about it in that way, um, rather as some kind of afterthought or um, thing, uh, you know, sort of in the world the father knows best, where we'll let it to the experts and the professionals to control it. Um, uh, that clearly hasn't been working out too well for us. Um, and so, um, again, uh, we mentioned the, the Carnegie Commission, which created, uh, eventually led to the creation of uh, CPB, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, PBS, and NPR, um, which in the very beginning held great promise. Um, you know, those of us who can remember, and people a little bit older than me have probably better memories. Um, that the first few years, right when that was created, there was some hope, and there were there were some independent films on, and there was some freeform programming even, um, and uh, uh, but unfortunately, almost immediately, that just started to disappear and become compromised. Um, in fact, just in a few years, by the mid '70s, they already were relaxing the rules on uh, exactly how you could give credit to a corporation on on public TV, for instance. Um, and then, of course, when Reagan came in, that was really the beginning of the end of, of public broadcasting as we knew it in the United States. Uh, we allowed them, uh, we allowed the Reagan administration, essentially, there was very little fight put up at the time, to uh, uh, really relax the commercialism uh, rules um, involving uh, public TV and public radio. And so uh, it was continually compromised in a series of steps. Um, and uh, that's actually where I got interested in this stuff because I grew up understanding what public media was supposed to be. It's supposed to be non-commercial. And uh, right as I came of age, it just started becoming commercial. And so to me, that was something that was very upsetting. I hope it is to you as well. Um, now, let's see. Uh, uh, once. The, once the Reagan administration got done with the situation, they also tried to cut the funding. Throughout its history, public media in the United States has simply been this punching bag, really. Uh, it's just been uh, something to toss around. Uh, 